I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us. Uh, this has just been an incredible uh, program that was conceived by Jim Rothenberg and Larry Gilbert, and you'll hear, you'll hear more about that from Katie Way uh, and from our president. But without further ado, permit me to please introduce uh, Caltech's president, Dr. Tom Rosenbaum. Great, thank you, Rich. Uh, and I wanted to add my thanks to Rich's for you joining us. And it's really fun to see so many uh, friends and so many dedicated uh, supporters of Caltech. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, it's a very odd time. I mean, of course, we've been going through the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we do not have undergraduates on campus, but the graduate students are here and research continues in the laboratories. And over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, we're inundated with smoke and fires. Uh, fires came within uh, 500 uh, feet of Mount Wilson, but it seems to be uh, due to heroic efforts uh, safe for now. Fortunately, the campus itself is not under threat. Uh, so it is, uh, is a time when you really uh, start uh, thinking about uh, what matters. And uh, one thing that comes to the fore is the role that science has to play if we're gonna solve these kinds of problems, if we're gonna address climate change, if we're gonna be able to find vaccines for viruses. And it's of course not just the fundamental discovery, the fundamental discovery is of course essential, but it's the translation of those discoveries into technologies that improve people's lives. And, and this is, of course, where the Rothenberg Innovation Initiative has been such a powerful part of campus efforts. It really has given faculty focus and hope that when they come across something, there will be the resources and the infrastructure available that they can pursue those ideas to the point where they see if they're gonna be viable. And this is something, frankly, that Caltech did not have before and it has enriched our environment and it will enrich society in the sense of uh, being able to uh, find these technologies and push the state of the art forward. You'll hear about some of them today, of course, you've seen others, so this is a continuing process, uh, but it gets uh, deeper and richer every time. Um, as Rich mentioned, this really started uh, with Jim Rothenberg um, who was just an incredible visionary. Uh, the, of course, Jim is no longer with us, uh, but his family has taken up this mission, incredible passion. And it is really, we're so grateful to, to the Rothenbergs that way. And uh, we're particularly grateful this evening to have Dan and Katie here joining us. And, uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to Katie. Well, thank you, President Rosenbaum. Um, it is not every day I get introduced by the president of Caltech. Thank you very much. And, and thank you everyone here this evening. I am deeply honored to be a part of the journey that is RI Squared. Um, and RI Squared is a story inherently about innovation. It's also the story of partnership, of sharing and trusting and paving a path forward to realize ideas that could benefit society and potentially bring them from the lab to the marketplace. Larry Gilbert brought his knowledge of tech transfer to Caltech in the mid 90s and he revolutionized how that work was done at Caltech. His insight and brilliance blended with my dad's generosity and intensity and together they have yielded something truly special. My dad, Jim Rothenberg, uh, was nothing if not loyal. This loyalty came through in his commitment to the Capital Group, the one place he worked from 1970 until his death in 2015. His commitment to the Pittsburgh Steelers, the team he cheered on with great fervor and aggression, his whole life, regardless of their potential to win, though we did have a strong start to the season this past Monday, and his commitment to Harvard, the school he attended for undergrad and business school and for which he cared deeply and served in many capacities, including as treasurer of the Harvard Corporation. And that loyalty is what makes his commitment to Caltech all the more impressive to me, since he had no personal connection to the school. 
He joined the board in 2006, and by 2008, with Larry Gilbert's guidance, he and my mom, Ann Rothenberg, helped establish the Caltech Innovation Initiative. To, um, established it to help bring to fruition great ideas. My dad was smart enough to know what he didn't know, and he had the means to empower those who could try to create and initiate the kind of change that was not within his ability to do so. His initial investment in this innovation initiative is a testament to his recognition that world-changing technology is happening right here in Pasadena, and that with the right kind of support, it can be actualized instead of getting mired in red tape. And for those of you who knew my dad, you know that finding a way to get things done quickly, efficiently, and without red tape was simply part of his DNA, and possibly his greatest joy. That this innovation initiative was renamed to honor him after he died helps keep his values alive in this work. Be nimble, be efficient, and get it done. The last thing I wanna share is that RA Squared is also a story about legacy. It is about the legacy my dad left all of us in terms of his work ethic, his spirit, and his determination. And it is that legacy that Dan, Rich, and I carry forward and seek to continue, and with your help, to grow. So I wanna thank you all for being here tonight as we continue to honor my dad's vision in recognizing the tremendous value of Caltech as an institution and in supporting those who have the skills and insight to make things better in our world. Because if there was ever a time for us to invest in science, it is surely now. Thank you. And Rich, I will turn it to you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, I can't think of a better introduction uh, for the Rothenberg Innovation Initiative, and uh, that was eloquent and beautifully said, as always. Uh, we will talk a bit about one of the things that Katie mentioned, which is how do you um, very nimbly and efficiently invest in technology, early stage technology? Uh, and you'll be hearing from some of our faculty, uh, as well as from uh, our Chief Innovation Officer, Fred Farina. So let me give you a brief idea of the program, uh, and then I will turn it over to, to Dan and Fred. So we'll start with a, a brief interview. Dan Rothberg is gonna interview Fred Freena and talk a bit about RI Squared, uh, the genesis, but more importantly, the practicality of how it works. And the reason that we wanted to do that is there are literally too many companies already uh, since, since the founding of RI Squared, too many great ideas that have already been commercialized, and some of you know them all too well, having, uh, I know a few people on this call have even invested in a few of them. Uh, and so kind of going through one by one doesn't make sense, but talking about the process does make some sense. And they're gonna talk a bit about the process, some of the outcomes and why we think this has been successful uh, and how it is unique to Caltech. And then uh, after Fred and Dan uh, at about uh, half on the hour, uh, I'm gonna interview uh, two different uh, groups of faculty. First, uh, Drs. Kathy Faber and Julie Cornfield. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about their program in novel pathogen testing and novel materials. Uh, and then I'm going to interview Dr. Axel Scherer to talk a bit about his work in electrochemistry and creating rapid uh, tests, primarily for the veterinary uh, industry. And we'll talk a bit about how that potentially can translate into human subjects. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Fred Farina, who is our Chief Innovation Officer. Uh, many of you know him just as Fred. Uh, he's freshly back from Europe, uh, one of the few of us who actually has been able to travel overseas. Uh, so welcome, Fred and Dan. Uh, and Dan Rothmark obviously needs no introduction, and let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Um, you know, it's surprising to me that I still get nervous presenting, uh, even when I'm not in front of a group of people. Normally, you know, the old saying was just vision everybody naked, but I know none of you are wearing any pants from the waist down, so uh, we can all feel comfortable in that together. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. It's nice to see so many friendly faces. Uh, and new faces here. Um, I know some of you have a pretty full history with RI Squared and what we've done, but acknowledging the fact that we have a, a number of people on this meeting with a varying understanding and level, levels of familiarity with RI Squared, I'm gonna ask Fred to, to cover a lot of ground here pretty quickly, starting from the origins and the structure and the processes Rich talked about all the way to the kind of current state of events and, and where we are with RI Squared and, and what it's done for Caltech. So, you know, to lead off, Fred, I would ask you simply, what is the Rothenberg Innovation Initiative? 
and, and the second part of that, and more importantly, why is this funding that you're getting so important for the Caltech researchers? Thank you, Dan, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, at its roots, the uh, Rothenberg Innovation Initiative is a program that helps bring academic research one step closer to people. And what I mean by that is that one step closer to direct imp impact in people's lives. And as it turns out, it, it is an, an essential step in the process because under this program, it is pretty much the first opportunity where researchers are given funding to explore commercial applications of a, of a, of a technology beyond pure research. So under R Square, they are given funding to explore real life applications, do proof of concept, and or build a prototype. And surprisingly, that kind of uh, what I call transition funding is very sparse. Uh, in fact, the federal government is almost exclusively focused on funding fundamental research. Uh, and on the other side, you have the venture capital industry, and it has become rather risk averse and, and likes to invest in, in technologies that, um, that, that have been de-risked and, and show great market potential. So in, in general, many technology and throughout academia, I would say, many uh, technologies with high potential do lang languish and die in academic labs. And R Square is designed to prevent just that from happening and ensure that new ideas can attain their full potential to find a meaningful, meaningful application uh, and have societal impact. And so, as many of you know, uh, Caltech scientists in large part pursue basic research or curiosity driven research. And they try to understand the inner, wor inner workings of nature at a very basic level. And in the course of doing that, they develop new instruments, discover new phenomena, and invent new technologies. And more often than not, it is really unclear what useful application these technologies will have in the future. R Square is the key program that helped figure this out. So let's take an example of a project. Uh, Professor Brian Stoltz uh, invented this novel chemistry that enables, without like, getting too technical, the modification of certain ring-shaped structures uh, to be more three-dimensional. And it was probably thought that these structures found in most natural and synthetic molecules were actually difficult or even impossible to make synthetically in three dimensions. And it turns out that most oncology pharmaceuticals and other drugs benefit from having this three-dimensional structure and are improved by this chemistry. So with our square funding, uh, Professor Stoltz was able to create uh, proof of concept drugs that demonstrated the practical application of the technology and the benefit it can provide uh, over existing drugs. This a few years later, very shortly after the, the, the R-squared funding uh, ended, uh, this led to the creation of a new startup uh, company called 1200 Pharma, which was launched uh, roughly three years ago and received tens of millions of dollars in venture funding. And as we speak, it is on track to begin clinical testing of its uh, first two cancer drugs, one for colon cancer and the other one for pancreatic cancer in early 2021. So this is an example of going from fundamental discovery to an actual application and impacting people's lives uh, in a very short time. Yeah, and I think uh, for those of you that were present at one of the past events, we had Brian and 1200 Pharma present, which was, which was incredible. Uh, Fred, you touched briefly on funding from government or outside venture capitalists or private equity firms. How does this differ from, from that type of investment for the professors? What are the benefits? Yeah, so, so first off, uh, you know, as I said earlier, there aren't many funding sources for early stage technologies coming out of academic labs, just that the way it is. Uh, a few, the few, and the few that exist uh, are difficult to access, take a long time to get, and have a, a very bureaucratic application process. Uh, and there's a few federal programs called SBIRs and SCTRs, and they take a very long time to, to access. So in contrast, R Square is designed to be very easy, uh, and as Katie said, completely non-bureaucratic. So we only require a four-page proposal and with a few key questions to address, such as uh, the potential applications of the technology and the goals that are expected to be achieved with the funding, which we called, uh, we called actually milestones. Do you, uh, can you expand on that a little bit? So as far as the proposal and 
you know, maybe specific questions of how many applications do you receive each year? What does the application process look like, the award process? And do you feel like with the current level of funding, you're able to meet the full potential of R I squared at this time? Yeah, so we typically receive between 25 and 30 applications every year. In, in the latest round in 2020, we received uh, 27 applications. And the process starts with a call for proposals in January uh, with submission deadline in April. Then there's a selection committee that includes external investors, venture capitalists, as well as faculty members and other commercialization experts that uh, review the proposal. Uh, they convene in April, May to discuss the potential awardees. And every time there are more good proposals and, and funding available. So we have to make difficult decisions. And uh, as a result, unfortunately, many worthy proposals do not get funded. Uh, you know, to be clear, all the proposals, without ex exceptions, uh, are, outs are outstanding from a scientific, scientific standpoint. This is Caltech. We get very high quality proposals. However, there are differences uh, in the maturity level of the, of the technology, uh, the type of milestones that can be achieved with 100K to 200 k per year, um, and the ability to, to raise venture money after one or two years of um, our spread funding. So the committee tries to make these assessments uh, and select the most promising projects um, in that way. So it's, it's, it's a difficult process because we have a lot of good proposals to choose from. Uh, unfortunately, we can't fund them all. Uh, and, and after uh, these awards are made um, and they're off in the labs doing the work, our, our teams, uh, team of uh, entrepreneurs in residence and uh, commercialization experts uh, try to help uh, guide the, the researchers to move the technology in a, in a, in a commercial direction. I'm sorry, that's one of the key trends you kind of keep touching on is commercialization as success and maybe having to turn down some ideas that are brilliant scientifically but, but aren't going to make it on the commercial side. So how do you and Caltech measure success when you're looking at RI squared and you know, maybe you can expand a little bit to show the, the group here some of the success stories, but you know, how many companies have been founded via RI squared, how many patents have come out of it? Uh, you know, is there stories of success in there that the numbers of companies and patents don't really capture? Yeah, uh, so I would say a clear measure of success would, is when uh, an R squared funding uh, funded projects leads to the formation of a startup that's able to attract uh, external investment, and particularly for venture cap from venture capital uh, money. Um, so that's that's a clear. Mark, um, but also uh, I would say that our square funding can lead to large federal grants as well that would not have been uh, awarded but for the work done under our square. So we can consider that success as well because it leads to large federal funding that can lead to more technologies in the future. Uh, additionally, uh, even if a project does not lead to the formation of a startup, more often than not, the key patents will be developed under our square. And, uh, and, and which may lead in the future to a startup at some point. Uh, many times, uh, it's very typical at Caltech, um, the, the ideas from the faculty and the students and the researchers are ahead of, of their time. And, and so sometimes it takes five, 10 years before uh, an application in the market appears uh, and, it, and the outside world is ready to, to absorb these technologies. Um, so you asked about number of startups, patents, all that. Um, you know, over almost 10 years now, the program we've we've seen uh, the formation of 17 startups. Uh, and you have to remember that uh, you know you should discount the last three to five years because it takes time to get the funding and then launch a startup. So really, we're looking at uh, you know six years at most, six seven. Um, uh, of programming and that led to 17 startups formed and, and currently four are pending uh, to be launched. Uh, a total of 135 inventions were made under this and uh, something like 80 some patents were filed and uh, many of them have been issued already. 
So very, very fruitful um, program from a, an IP standpoint and a startup standpoint. And I, one more thing I want to add is, uh, you know, as was said before by our president, uh, it really fosters the entrepreneurial culture around campus and stimulates our researchers' creativity. So it's a place where researchers can dream, dream big uh, without being uh, constrained by the calls from, you know, the federal calls that have um, particular, uh, you know, specific research that should be done. They can think broad and, and, uh, and, they, and, they, and they do think big. That's great. Uh, beyond RI Squared and that initial funding, what is your office and, and the Office of Tech Transfer and Caltech do to support the faculty entrepreneurs that you're talking about? Yeah, so funding is, of course, a key part of moving technologies to market. But uh, I would say almost equally as important is the guidance from, um, and, and, and mentorship from people who have experience uh, who have experience with technology commercialization. And so we have a team of commercialization experts in the Office of Technology Transfer and Corporate Partnerships. Uh, and the team includes people who understand patent protection, licensing, tech commercialization. And in addition, uh, more recently, uh, we've uh, started this program for entrepreneurs in residence and um, where we try to uh, bring people in who have created uh, and run startups before who have spent many years in industry and know how to turn a technology into a commercial product. So that expert human support uh, helps our researchers better utilize the funding from R Square toward a, uh, a successful commercial outcome. Great. Um, and I'm getting waved off on time here, Fred, so I'm going to cut down on some of the questions I was going to ask you. but. You know, you've just completed the process for selecting new awards for this year. Can you quickly share something about the technologies you've seen developed um, with the new RI Squared Awards and maybe just briefly go into some of those and maybe mention a couple that didn't make the cut? Sure. Um, so we're going to hear about two projects a little later, so I won't talk about these. Um, uh, some uh, the other exciting projects we, we funded this year include a, a drug screening platform for psychiatric disorders, disorders such as depression and anxiety, um, a LIDAR uh, system on a chip. Uh, LIDAR is a radar that uses laser light, and which is a key sensor for autonomous vehicles. Uh, we also have uh, funded a wearable opioid monitoring system to help in the treatment of addiction uh, and also help prevention, prevent addiction in the first place. Uh, we have a, a new type of computer with specialized application, applications such as machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence. Uh, then uh, another technology, the wearable sensor to, that monitors core body temperature, uh, important in the medical field. Um, and of course, as you said, then uh, we have a few that were not funded and just to name a couple, uh, a virtual reality system for medical imaging applications. Uh, you can imagine being in the doctor's office and with your uh, VR um, goggles and the doctors explaining how the organs work and the kind of treatments that we're giving you. Um, and another technology is a, a new laser technology for quantum communication and computing. So those two, unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to find. Well, thank you, Fred. Uh, I really appreciate it. I could do this all day. I know. Um, you know, a lot of the success of RI Squared would not be here without you and, and your office. Um, you've got done a lot beyond the funding of the ideas and, and RI Squared has led to, you know, further work from the entrepreneurs and residents, um, further de-risking of these companies as they go on and, you know, looking at incubator space and the ecosystem for startups at Caltech has dramatically improved. Um, I know we've talked about the venture fund and kind of co-investment vehicles and things of that nature that could spin off of this too. So it's all very exciting, um, but I've got to stop here and, and open it up and hopefully you get some nice questions from the group here. Um, but I want to remind everybody if, if we don't do it now, Fred, I and others can stick around after these presentations are over to answer any questions anyone has. But if anyone's got questions, let me know and we can address them now or um, we can do it on the backside. Let me add a, a more and more things as, as people are thinking about questions, uh, they have them. Um, 
one thing to recognize is that our square has really been the launch pad for other programs. So we started that 10 years ago and then we realized like, well, we really need that, uh, you know, entrepreneurial knowledge from, you know, the trenches to come in and, and help these technologies move forward. And from that came the entrepreneur in residence program that's been around for now five years. And that's very, very successful. And, 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 and now key to how we do our business. And uh, we're also working on establishing an incubator um, for startups and to provide specialized space and equipment to new startups and particularly for the ones coming out of R squared. Uh, and as Dan alluded to, we are looking at maybe launching a seed fund to provide the first investment uh, to new startups, um, you know, beyond R squared. So it's really been a hub for these uh, new programs. I've got, I, I think, one question in the chat here on how does Caltech balance applied science and pure science when they're looking at RI squared? Uh, I would say that most of Caltech is, you know, the, the DNA of Caltech is uh, under, understanding really at the basic level uh, how things work in nature. And, 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 and in doing that, you have to develop new technologies to really understand how things work. And from those technologies, uh, then other applications come up, and and that's when things are redirected to. There's, a, there's a, an avenue for faculty then to say, okay, I have this fundamental discovery, uh, I have this new instrument that allows me to look into how this works, and that's going to be applied to medical imaging, for example. And then we have this program through R squared, and then beyond to bring these great technologies to the market so it can benefit people. Great. Uh, thank you, Fred, again, for um, taking the time and doing this and, and giving that great overview. And uh, Rich, we'll, we'll turn it back to you to delve into a little more specifics on the two companies. And, and as before we, before we jump in with the two faculty, uh, first of all, thank you for that. Um, I, I want to make another comment about what you and Fred were just talking about there at the end, which is, there is almost not a single faculty member, I'm pretty sure Tom Rosenbaum would agree with this, that comes to Caltech thinking they wanna come here to start companies. Uh, that's not the nature of what we do at Caltech and it's not the nature of um, what most of our faculty are trying to do. However, along the way, as faculty develop their science or their engineering, it's not uncommon for them to recognize that they have solved an incredibly important problem. And in fact, for those of you who are investors on this call, and Fred can, uh, can say more about this, but Fred went back and did an analysis of the history of all the companies that have been spun out of Caltech, and it was 200 or something companies uh, over, the, over the period that he looked at. And the vast majority of the exits of those companies were in acquisitions. And when they delved a little deeper into that, what they ascertained was that the faculty set out to solve some particular problem. You're about to hear about two of them shortly. They didn't set out to start a company, which you hear of at lots of other institutions. Uh, they set out to solve some very important problem. Uh, the, a, a, a microscope or a window into some new way of addressing something, or they're a physicist who realized that they could apply something they knew in, uh, in optoelectronics to solving a, a medical problem or Maura Garib, who you heard from last year, who is a, a fluid mechanicist who became fascinated with how the heart and the cardiovascular system works. And in the process of solving that problem, they realized, wow, there's a company here. And as they went back and looked, all of these companies, they, they weren't forming the next Google or Facebook, <laughs> maybe to our chagrin, <laughs> although that's not what we're here to do, but they did fit this incredible niche. And so time and time again, when these companies were exiting, some other large company that also wanted to solve that problem came along and said, oh my God, these guys at Caltech solved that. And uh, that, that is a flywheel that has been very consistent for 25 years in tech transfer. And I'm gonna use that as a segue to introduce uh, doctors Kathy Faber and Julie Cornfield. Uh, for those of you who know, uh, Kathy joined the faculty at Caltech uh, when Tom became president of Caltech uh, and is uh, a material scientist and engineer. Julie is a chemical engineer. Um, Julie will tell you that she and I met almost 30 years ago playing against each other on the soccer field, and I won't tell you who was better, but I think everyone on the call knows that it was Julie. Um, and uh, uh, Axel Scher, who you'll hear from in a moment, and I actually met at Camp Fox in 1995, which is where we used to take the freshmen out to Catalina Island. I don't think we do that any longer. Um, so 
this, uh, I tell you that just to say, these are, these are old friends and uh, it very much is indicative of the, of the familial nature of the way things work at Caltech. So the way the format's gonna work, we're gonna do about 20 minutes with, uh, with each set of faculty. Uh, and then we'll include audience Q&A. Uh, please send me questions. I'll be looking for them in the chat. Or if you want to jump in, uh, you can feel free to unmic yourself and jump in. Uh, this is encouraged. And then again, as Dan mentioned at the end, we'll do an overtime uh, for anyone who'd like to stay on and ask more detailed questions. One of the things I'd like to talk about with uh, Kathy and Julie is they, they have developed uh, a, novel, a novel set of materials for pathogen testing. And it turns out that when you're looking at a variety of different pathogens, and we'll take sepsis, which is more a syndrome than it is a pathogen, uh, but many of you know that sepsis is incredibly difficult to diagnose. And even once you do diagnose it, it's often too late and the mortality rate is incredibly high and uh, particularly in pediatric cases. And so they have developed a, a novel material that allows them to actually collect and ultimately analyze pathogens. This is not a small problem. This is a problem that people have been working on for a very, very long time period of time. And you had a material scientist and a chemical engineer that got together. Uh, and so where, where I'd like to start with both of you is what inspired you to work on this problem and why, and how did the two of you get together? How did material science and chemical engineering, which aren't really that different, uh, but as a scientist, I think of them as being very different. <laughs> how did you guys get together and why this problem? Well, well, let me start here, if I may, Rich. Um, this is a, a very Caltech type of story. So six years ago, uh, when I joined the faculty here, it coincided with a time that um, engineering and applied science was putting together uh, their magazine and they were featuring applied physics and material science. And so we were all interviewed for this article. We were asked for images. And I suppose to be nice to the new kid on the block, uh, images that came out of my lab on porous ceramics made the cover of the magazine. And not so long after that, in, in what I call typical Caltech fashion, um, a research scientist from Julie's lab, Mamadou Diallo, uh, showed up at my door. No, no, uh, no appointment. He had this magazine in his hand and he said, there are things you can do with these materials. <laughs> and that started the conversation uh, with Julie and her group. And at the same time, at the same time, uh, Rustam Ismagalov was working on digital detection. And Julie was very much aware of that. And uh, it was then this confluence then that provided an opportunity to look at the porous ceramics that I was working on, uh, which would be useful for some size-based filtration. If you want to think about it as some sort of a sifter, if you will, or a sieve in, in taking uh, rocks out of the sandbox or something like that. But, but that's the concept. Um, but of course, we wanted a problem that was really important. And um, perhaps we, we could have a slide here to, to uh, say a little bit more about sepsis. So up, up in the left-hand corner, um, Julie has appropriately named this, what's the hurry? Well, you'll see what the hurry is. If you look up in this uh, left-hand corner that describes sepsis, uh, the, the black um, triangles here um, display patient survival rate, and this is over 36 hours. And you see that that survival rate uh, decreases by, by 8 to 15 percent an hour. So it's important not only to, to uh, see that there's a problem, but also to diagnose the bacteria or the pathogen that is the cause of the problem. And uh, so we took this as an important problem. Um, if you look down further in this, uh, in this particular figure, uh, the culprit in, in a case like this 
is the, is the pathogen. And what is absolutely remarkable is that in something like 10 milliliters of blood, there are only uh, 10 bacteria present that are, that are uh, causing all this havoc with, with uh, a system. Uh, you see in terms of the size scale that these are very small. They're next to this number 10. They're tiny compared to red blood cells, to white blood cells, and to platelets in the bloodstream. And you see why it is important to be able to, to separate these bacteria out of the bloodstream and do it in a hurry. And now it's a very good time for me to hand this over to Julie to talk about um, Rustum's digital detection methods. Oh, that was great, Kathy. Um, so uh, one discovery leads to another. So my colleague, Rustam Smogolov, had developed a way to take an array of microscopic cups. So uh, by the way, I forgot to tell Kathy, this thing in the background, that's a human hair. Uh. Okay, and uh, that human hair is the size of these little cups that are in an array that is commercially available. And Rustam has already shown that for samples that are relatively simple, like saliva for COVID or urine for urinary tract infection, he can run that fluid quickly through this array of cups, each one separated from another, he can give each vessel uh, the rea reagents required to amplify up the DNA of whatever pathogen got tra trapped in one of these little cups. Uh, and he's looking at one molecule per cup, okay? So he's got an array of cups. They have to stay separate. He puts in the reagents. The, the, the pores that have the DNA of the pathogen light up. And you can see it in, in some of his arrays. You can do it with a cell phone. Um, in some, you use a microscope. And you simply count the number of stars in this dark background. And uh, an example here, so this is to scale the array of cups at short time, Nothing's had enough time to amplify up the DNA and light up. Um, but starting at 10 and really clearly by 20 minutes, he can see the difference between an array that has pathogen and one that doesn't. And so that allows him within 25 minutes to uh, detect a pathogen and he's uh, enhanced this to the point where he can even figure out which antibiotic would uh, actually be effective against a given uh, bacterium in a given patient. Um, and he can complete that analysis within 30 minutes from the time that they uh, have a saliva swab or give a urine sample. The problem, he told us, is that for the most life-threatening condition where speed is the most important, you have all of these cells in the background. You've got the red blood cells, the platelets, the white cells, and they're going to tend to obscure and interfere with the capture of the real culprit. So he told me this problem, and I'm like, wow, that's a tough problem, man. I have no idea what to do about that. And then I find out about Kathy's ceramics. And they provide pores that are isolated from each other. Each one is a little cup. That's exactly what Rustam needs. And their, their diameter, so the size here of one of the channels that goes straight through these gorgeous ceramics Kathy makes, is big enough that the big cells, the red cells, the white cells, they'll just run right through. And then the, the bacteria they have a particular signature among all these species. They diffuse the fastest. And so they can explore the dendritic structure of these incredible pores that Kathy can make. And so because of Rustam's accomplishments, oh, and I wanted to mention, when Kathy and I have this material ready, Rustam will be ready because on July 31st, he was picked by the NIH 
as one of the seven companies to do rapid diagnostics for COVID. So by December, he'll be scaled up to do millions of tests. And he'll have solved all kinds of problems with scale up and detection. So by the time we've done our humble part, which is to create a new material that's just right for blood, he'll be ready. And so we're not resolving what he did. We're just going to slot right in and um, provide this new material that will enable analysis of blood. And so, Kathy, I'll, I'll give it back to you for telling them how this beautiful material is made. I, Kathy, before we do that, I want to level yep. set for people so they understand what we're, what we're dealing with here. So just to give folks an idea, there are about 1.7 million adults uh, in the U.S. that are annually uh, diagnosed with sepsis and about 270,000 deaths. Mm -hmm. So between five and 10 times the number of people uh, that die of flu annually die of sepsis. That number is close to 15 million on a global basis. And again, the problem that they identified, two problems, number one is you can't even diagnose it. By the time you diagnose it, the patient is already decompensated and, and may not make it. The state of the art are complicated syndromic algorithms. There's actually a company that also has its foundation at Caltech called Genmark Diagnostics, which sells a syndromic panel for sepsis, which measures all kinds of things. Yes, it looks at bacteria, but it also looks at like the temperature and the patient's blood pressure. And, and so the diagnostic value of that is about a third of the time maybe they can get it. And the world spends about half, I mean, the US spends about half a billion dollars a year on that. So you can imagine if we could actually just collect these 10 particles, I say just, it's incredibly difficult to collect those 10 particles, uh, especially without that substrate, uh, that material, uh, then we could actually do the analysis. So the rate limiting step was being able to get those 10 particles and to isolate them and to know that you had those 10 particles. So right. now, now that you guys have identified that and you've got, you know, you can hand it to Rustam and he'll analyze it, but how do you turn that into a product that somebody could actually use in a hospital setting quickly, very quickly? So there's, there's two parts of that. One is that Kathy's method, so she can show you how, it, how these things are made, uh, it scales. So the method could be used to provide these little, it's like a size of a credit card that Rustam uh, distributes that have this array of little cups in them. So Kathy's method lends itself to scale up. And then all the other uh, aspects, a lot of them, we can piggyback on Rustam. So how to sterilize, how to put it in a format where the fluid can be uh, put through it in a short enough time, how to do the optical analysis. So we can focus mainly on controlling the structure and then producing uh, in a scalable way the, the membranes, I think. So let me tell you a little bit about the, the structure. And I think once I do that, uh, you will understand how it could be scalable. So if we could turn the slides on again, thank you very much. So uh, the, the method that we use is something called freeze casting. So we start with a solution. Uh, part of the solution is a, um, ceramic precursor in the form of a polymer, and the other part is a solvent. And we simply freeze it. And we know enough, enough about uh, solidification and freezing that we can choose the right solvent and we can choose the, the right rates of freezing that we can end up with these beautiful crystals that are made of the solvent that we can freeze dry away and, and we're left with pores. Now these uh, particular um, pores, their morphology is dendritic and you see this right in the center here. Maybe I can, uh, can get uh, an uh, arrow here. Um, they're dendritic. They, they look like trees. They have a large trunk and they have side arms that you would consider branches. And so if you look at the image then uh, further to the right, if you were uh, looking down upon this filter, 
you would see the outline, this black outline of the pores that uh, look like crosses here. But the much more important part is the side view. If we were to take a knife and cut one of these dendrites down the center, you see all of these beautiful uh, side pockets or branches that uh, are separated from nearby ones, uh, but uh, they now provide the uh, places that this bacteria will be exploring. Now there's a very important aspect of this that's related to the fluid dynamics of blood flowing through this. And so if we uh, move on to the, the next slide, uh, Julie can talk about that fluid dynamics. The materials that Kathy makes, I've never seen anything like it. And uh, the way that these crystals grow and carve out these caves creates an amazing opportunity that I never would have even thought was possible until I saw the micrographs of what Kathy makes. So if you have a big pore, it's about half the width of a human hair, but that's plenty of space for red blood cells to come passing through without getting stuck. Uh, and likewise, the white blood cells, they can just pass right through without plugging this thing up. And meanwhile, the bacteria can diffuse and they explore the, uh, the circulating flow in these little caves, which is much slower than the flow down the middle of this channel. And that means that by the time we get all the blood filtered through this device, the bacteria have more than a 90% probability of being lost in one of these caves where they're going to be trapped and analyzed by Rooster. So I'll go back to you, Kathy, about the, uh, or would you like me to talk about the microgram? Oh, I'll just uh, talk about this very quickly. So, um... In early June, when our laboratories opened up again, our, our two fantastic graduate students, uh, Nori Arai and uh, Arlen Bateman, got together and said, okay, it's time to do the experiment with E. coli. And in early uh, June, they did that. On the right-hand side, you see this micrograph. Again, you're looking, we're looking inside the pores and the colorized version here of these green uh, particles are E. coli. And 97% uh, of the E. coli was either captured or retained in, in the membrane. And uh, they found 3% that passed through. So we were, as you can imagine, we were absolutely thrilled. And this is probably a good time to answer some questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, let me open it up to questions. Uh, either questions can come directly to me or to the group, uh, or if people have some, they can feel free to shout them out. Uh, sepsis is a, is a bacteria that, that uh, follows a, a precursor infection, if I understand it right. One of the challenges is that it could be a bacteria, or it could be a fungus, or it could be a virus. And if you just jump into treating it with antibiotics, you're not going to help the patient who's got a problem that's viral or fungal. The other thing is there are very sad cases where the doctors, without waiting the 36 hours for the test result, administer antibiotics and just observe the patient to see if they get better. And I was reading one where the patient died of a heart attack. So they had a largely occluded artery that was giving the symptoms. So um, the, the, um, the reaction of the body can be due to a strong immune response against an infection, but it also matches some other conditions. And so you need to know, yeah, quickly, is it a bacteria, bacterial infection or not? Yeah. yeah. That's what I was trying to get at is that the, 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 the fatality associated with sepsis is, is associated with your uh, immune system's uh, yeah. uh, uh, sense and control system going haywire. Yes. Uh, and, and if I understand the COVID issues so properly, often that uh, persists yes. well, well beyond after the uh, is not there. Uh, um, the statistics are pretty good for patients who have sepsis due to bacteria. 
uh, they tend to do very well when you treat it with antibiotics. And maybe that's because the time it takes for the antibiotic to work is the time it takes for your immune system to just quiet down. And so maybe it looks like it's parallel. Um, so I wasn't aware that there can be a long sustained immune response after the pathogen is, is under treatment. In fact, there are people are, have, there have been some publications recently making some comparisons to what's happening with COVID where these patients have a cytokine storm where their body releases yeah. an enormous immune response and kills yeah. them. Ultimately, it's not the sepsis that kills you. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, it's the heart attack or the, the major yeah. cardiovascular event or the, the immune response. Yeah. yeah. Why do the uh, bacteria go into these side caves? And do fungi and uh, viruses also do the same? Um, so the special thing is that they're uh, separated based on the fact that they diffuse faster than a big object. So by virtue of their small size, the, the bacteria at the rate we're flowing through, they have enough time to explore the sides of this big pore in the middle. And so they'll get caught on these streamlines and we find them caught on the walls of the caves. That will also work for viruses. They're even smaller, so they diffuse even faster. For fungi, it's different. So if they have a body shape that's relatively compact, then we would be able to get them into the side cavities and detect them. But if they are these long stringy things, they might not, uh, they might not get into the side cavities. So, so far we haven't made any claims about uh, being able to detect uh, the fungi at all. Uh, luckily at Caltech, we do have some people who could help us if we get the problem working for uh, bacteria and then for viruses, there are experts at Caltech who could help us out with the uh, fungi. So uh, uh, we have time for one question from uh, Bruce Nickerson, and then I want to encourage everyone, there is time over time at the end of this uh, for, for folks to come back to Julie and Kathy and ask more questions. But Bruce, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, um, and as a pediatric pulmonologist, I've spent uh, many uh, nights awake in the ICUs and mm -hmm. so on. And I find this really exciting. And there's obviously a lot of practical um, problems and a lot of research that's got to go into to developing it. But um, it, it is exciting. Um, there, there are people, uh, there are lots of researchers who give rats sepsis uh, to study sepsis and so on. So there are lots of animal models that you can use to, to work on this. Um, kids uh, will not, especially neonatology, which has a lot of sepsis in preemies, uh, you can't take 10 cc's of blood out of them uh, or you need to transfuse them. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to, to make it smaller, but kids uh, fortuitously tend to have more bacteria in their uh, bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So that, that would help you. Um, that each bacteria is probably somewhat different. So Pseudomonas, uh, E. coli, Staph, uh, other organisms, but those are common ones that cause sepsis, would probably have somewhat different characteristics. Um, and the idea that you could, uh, the, the implication of what you said was you could do uh, look at antibiotic resistance is is really exciting uh, if you can really do that because a lot of times you you think a patient is septic you're going to treat them with antibiotic but the antibiotic choices uh, are different and have different toxicities right. and for example the most common drugs for staph and the most common drugs for pseudomonas uh, both have kidney toxicity so you don't really want to give both together uh, and put the patient in a renal failure. Um, um, do you have a sense, do you need 10 cc's of blood? Um, uh, there are practicalities on how you keep the blood from clotting and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, um, you know, have, have, do you have medical partners? We have no medical partners as yet. 
uh, but we're relying heavily on Rustam Ismaglov and his digital detection methods. And so he's going to tell us if we need uh, 10 bacteria or, or fewer. Yeah, and so that's the thing. <clears throat> if uh, if um, uh, pediatric cases would have 10 or more bacteria in one mill of blood, then yeah. our platform would be able to trap them and then have them isolated in containers for Rustum. Um, and the smaller the volume, actually the faster we can analyze the blood because we need to get it to flow through the device. And so if we could you know, have uh, pretty good confidence that in one mill, there would be 10 or more uh, bacteria cells, then we could also do the analysis much faster. Mm -hmm. Just in the interest of time and uh, in fairness to Axel, I'm going to move us on. Axel Scherer, uh, who is uh, an, an, one of our serial entrepreneurs, um, and uh, as I mentioned, Axel and I have been friends a long time, and I've, I've watched him develop a number of these companies. Uh, but I was very interested to know that he had uh, a desire to develop a diagnostic for animals. And the reason is, I don't know if people have an idea of these numbers, but just to, just to level set and frame this for folks, there are about 90 million dogs as pets in the United States and about 95 million cats. And pet owners spend a little over $5 billion with a B dollars a year just on diagnostics for these animals. Because again, Rover and Fluffy can't tell you what's wrong. Um, and out of those animals, and we're gonna talk a little about glucose, about 1% of those cats, so about a million cats, domestic cats, have diabetes. And uh, about a third of those cats actually get treated and that's a climbing number. So uh, if, if you need to hear more about how big the diagnostics market is, I, I'm happy to wax poetic later, but um, let's, let me turn it over to Axel. He's gonna tell you a bit about uh, the electrochemistry that, that he and uh, his collaborators developed and also the ability to miniaturize this and to analyze incredibly, incredibly small uh, amounts of interstitial fluid, which is the key to this whole thing. Uh, it was ultimately a fu fundamental physics problem that no one's been able to solve until, until Axel did this. Uh, and then talk a bit about the application space. And, uh, and Axel, if those are, are wondering where Axel is, Axel, he'll tell you he's actually in quarantine <laughs> because he's just come back from the University of Missouri where they apparently have a very high uh, caseload. Um, so Axel, thank you for agreeing to do this because I know you just landed recently and uh, you're doing this remotely. Uh, so we appreciate it. But maybe you could tell us a bit about how you started and why this idea. Sure. Yeah. This this all started about uh, uh, ten um, ten years ago um, when we decided to use uh, little RF tag chips, uh, microelectronic uh, CMOS chips, to try to analyze uh, 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 to try to to measure uh, glucose for diabetes patients. So 10 years ago, we decided to, to, to analyze uh, glucose and build these chips. And we built tiny ones, a uh, millimeter by a millimeter in size. If you can uh, take one of the, uh, the slides that I have uh, and put it up there, that would be helpful. What we decided to do at that point was to focus on glucose in people. So we had a, a um, yeah, so, so this, this shows you our glucometer. It actually is, a, uh, that's the, the reader. And if you go to the next slide, it shows you the actual sensor that goes into them, into the, uh, that, that gets injected. It's only about a millimeter by a millimeter in size. And it has uh, about 20,000 transistors on it. And it measures glucose by using a, uh, a potentiostat. Uh, so it, it also has this, uh, these antennas on the outside, it basically has a coil antenna, and it is an RF tag. So it's very much, very similar to the kind of RF tags that you would use to identify packages. Uh, and so we use this RF tag to communicate between the reader that you just saw and this sensor through the skin. So the sensor's inside the body, the reader's outside of the body, and we were going to measure glucose. And what was very interesting is that we could make the sensor uh, not only sensitive, but very fast. So it can actually measure within a tenth of a second. You can get a good reading for glucose 
or any other 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 sort of uh, electrochemical uh, uh, you know si signal. The problem with these sensors is that they have a limited lifetime. In order to measure, you need to have an enzyme. That enzyme generates hydrogen peroxide when it sees glucose. And uh, after a while, the enzyme typically, typically deteriorates. So in order to stabilize that enzyme, we had to play a whole bunch of tricks. So if you go to the next slide, this is what we typically do in order to, uh, to protect the enzyme. We actually metalize it. We put a metal, a thin metal layer, platinum in this case, on top of the enzyme layer. Uh, and then we also have a platinum electrode underneath the enzyme layer. So we have a metal enzyme metal sandwich. And so uh, most people don't uh, metallize enzymes because you tend to dehydrate them and, and, and it's very difficult. Uh, we found a way to keep the enzyme wet while we're depositing the metal. And that allows us to have this porous surface that protects the enzyme and prevents the body's immune system to see that it's there. Uh, it also allowed us to make very, very sensitive devices. Um, so if you go to the next slide, it sort of uh, summarizes what we've done. These last for a very long time. They, they last for up to 10, 12 months rather than a couple of days. Go to the next slide, it shows you um, sort of the curve of the deter deterioration curve. Um, I'm not going to bore you with that. Go, go, let's go to the next slide. Then. Uh, the idea really is to uh, not only do this for people, but to also have devices for our furry friends, for cats and dogs that, that as, we, as we heard just a moment ago, uh, presents a relatively large market. So it turns out that there is a great opportunity of connecting what we know works in electrochemistry and having our furry friends help us uh, test it out and also test out a couple of hypotheses that we're going to talk about a little bit uh, of what else we can do other than measure glucose for diabetic animals. I should mention that for dogs in particular, diabetes is a very serious disease because they typically suffer from type one diabetes and it's very difficult to meter and the, the insulin because it's, it's, it's very difficult to get the samples and, and to maintain it. So there's a huge problem in terms of logistics to try to, try to maintain the insulin level of your animal. And so the idea here is that we take our reader and we can put that on the collar of the, of the dog or the cat. And then underneath the collar, we have injected this little device that measures glucose. And that can then give you the uh, continuous reading of, of the, the, the glucose level in, 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 the, in, in the animal. Uh, down the road, of course, we will when we've tested this out and it works well in animals, we can also do the same thing in people. Uh, I should mention that the sensors themselves are very inexpensive. We make them uh, about 64,000 at a time on each wafer. Uh, so, so they basically cost about 10 cents for each, for each device. And the reader's about $50. So the maintenance for this kind of uh, uh, you know, measurement is, is actually not very expensive. The main thing is that you have to inject the sensor and uh, that's the best, best place to do that is to have your dog or your vet, vet, veterinarian or, or some animal clinic uh, put that in for you. Uh, so for that, of course, it makes uh, no sense to have a sensor that only lasts for a week you want to have about six months lifetime or th at least three months lifetime for the sensor. And we are now at the point where our devices work that long. So uh, we're, we're starting, uh, very excited about starting working with uh, uh, animal uh, hospitals, uh, try these things out and test really how, how these devices respond. And uh, we're starting a, a, a commercial endeavor 
to do that. Axel, again, I want to level set and make sure people understand exactly the problem or series of problems that you solved. Because there are a lot of people that can do electrochemistry. There's a little company in San Diego that makes glucose uh, monitors. You know, P P Abbott makes, you can walk into a CVS and buy a glucose monitor. So the electrochemistry around glucose oxidase reactions is like, you know, ho-hum, right? Yeah. But being able to put something inside an animal or a human and not have the body attack it, so immunogenicity, or even if it does attack it, because it will attack it once it goes in there, being able to preserve the reaction. That's what I want people to take away from this, is the ability for you to create a closed system that allows you to let fluid come in whenever it wants to come in, but still preserve the chemistry so that you actually preserve the reaction. That, that is what blew me away the first time I saw this. And if you, we don't have to go back to the slide, we can if you want, but that slide yeah, yeah. that shows that device and your ability to kind of isolate that reaction, that's extraordinary. And how many people have tried to do this over how many years? I mean, I know you tried to do it over oh, many years. Well, th there's a long history of people uh, building uh, glucose monitors. I think it goes all the way back to the 1960s. Uh, of course, um, the, the continuous glucose monitors uh, were, were started in the 1980s. But the, uh, the interesting thing is, yes, you oftentimes, or all of the times, you have this limited lifetime because the body sees the glucose oxidase or whatever other enzyme you use and slowly attacks it and corrodes it away. So by platinum plating the enzyme, we, we actually hide it from the immune system. Uh, and what we see is we have this much longer lifetimes uh, in, in our animal experiments. So, so the, the, this is, this is um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting opportunity to go, to go down that road. What are the other areas that you could go after? Because there's other things that we can measure with electric chemistry. You could measure hormones, you could measure, I know you said you could measure temperature. There's nothing to stop you from putting multiple analyses on a single, and when he says injected, I want people to understand, this is just a simple needle like you'd give a dog a vaccine. It's being, this is something the size of a grain of salt that's being injected under the, the animal's skin. The idea really is that glucose is just the very beginning um, of, of what we can do. Uh, we can measure glucose and identify if you're a diabetic, um, uh, you know, how much insulin we need to administer. But it's actually, um, glucose is not very interesting if you're not a diabetic. Um, it, it actually is very well regulated and it's very constant. What we really are interested in is measuring uh, the biomarkers that would identify your health. So for example, if I get a blood test, um, every year I go to the doctor's office, they give me a blood test, the phlebotomist takes some blood out and they measure about 38 different chemistries. And, to, and most of the time, they measure chemistries that don't change much because they want to compare my blood levels this year with the ones last year, right? So, so they don't want to have these things uh, depend on whether I ran, ran up a flight of stairs or not, right? And that, that means that I'm measuring, uh, when I do a blood test, I'm measuring a static picture of, of what my body is doing at this moment. But what we really want is we want to identify what the metabolism is doing. And in order to do that, what we really want to do is see a change in, 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 in the chemistry. And by putting these continuous monitors into the body and measuring things like lactate, where, for example, if I go up a flight of stairs, uh, the lactate level will go up, right? Because I've just exercised. Then it becomes really interesting to not measure the absolute concentration of lactate, but measure how fast the body's, uh, the lactate level goes back down to its regular baseline. <clears throat> because that'll tell me something about my metabolism. And so, so the whole purpose of these kinds of sensors is not just to get a static picture of something, but to get, a, get a, uh, an understanding of the changes in the metabolism. And so where our furry friends come in, is they, they, they actually have the same problems we have. They have the same chronic diseases. They suffer from diabetes. They, they, um, and, and we can actually measure these kinds of things in their normal surrounding, okay? They live with us in the same space. They drink the same water. They uh, breathe the same air. 
and we can um, identify, you know, the hypothesis, for example, that I just mentioned, what if we measured lactate as a function of time and figure out how fast it recovers? We can, we can t try these things out and, and measure them uh, uh, with our companions. And we can go one step further and say, a typical dog lives about seven times less uh, in terms of lifetime, life expectancy than, than us. They live in the same place, they're exposed to the same hazards. So if my dog started to suffer from cancer, I would get worried, right? And we can identify uh, some of these things uh, that might cause trigger thing, uh, diseases by looking at the continuous change in metabolism with time. So, so initially we're gonna do glucose measurements because there is a huge uh, population of dogs and cats that suffer from diabetes, and they can be, uh, you know, treated if they if you can do this kind of measurement. But down the road, we'll want to measure all sorts of other biomarkers and identify sort of the health of the animal. Well, and you know, if if everyone on this call's head is is spinning, and I I hope it is around all the different things that you could apply to this technology. Guess what? You're right. Uh, and, and, and let your head spin a little bit, because in the first meeting that I had with Axel, we identified uh, everything from uh, uh, mare breeding for the thoroughbred horse racing market, which make no mistake is an enormous, enormous economic market, to whether or not we could actually predict a heart attack and a high risk ischemia. Because one of the things we know about patients that have ischemic heart attacks, you know, where they have a clot, is that typically there are uh, precursor warnings around catecholamines uh, and other and troponin and other uh, stress markers, uh, you know, among other things that we've thought about as well, including stroke. So, um, Axel, I want to pause. Uh, I want to give folks a chance to ask you questions, but before I do, I also want to I also want to give you a shout out about something else, just because I. You know, as a friend, I sort of like to take credit for the stuff that you do just because we're friends. But the, the other thing that you've done recently, which is so mind blowing, uh, and you're way too modest to say it, is that from the time COVID started, and for those who don't know, Axel sold one of his companies, actually, I think his first, one of his first companies he co-founded with Julie Cornfield, by the way, Fluidime, they were co-founders of that company. But um, Axel uh, has sold a company to, uh, to Illumina, and so he's been in this space. But from the time COVID started to within, uh, I want to say, Axel, it was six weeks or something that you did it, but it was probably maybe two months, six weeks to two months. Yeah, two months, I think, this part. May yeah. Maybe, yeah. May maybe tell everybody what you did in a, in a two-month time frame from the time we identified COVID to what you now have as a new company. Yeah, so we started a company uh, based on a uh, – QPR, Q QPCR system that we had developed for the Gates Foundation. So it turns out that uh, 10 years ago, we got some uh, funding from the Gates Foundation to look for, for point of care uh, testing systems that would work in the developing world uh, that in low resource settings. Uh, the idea was you don't have a uh, medium complexity lab, you don't have the kind of transportation that you would need to move samples around efficiently. So you need to measure where, wherever you are. And so we basically took uh, the old blueprints of our QPCR machine. And uh, in March, uh, our group decided, hey, we're just gonna, gonna do this again. And, and this time we'll bring it over the finish line. And, uh, and instead of using it for Ebola in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, we're going to use it right here uh, to, to measure COVID-19 patients. And uh, now we actually have instruments. We have 10 prototypes that are running in different places. And we have um, uh, cartridges that, that are working that I, I just came back from the University of Missouri. We, they have an outbreak there in their, in their uh, college. And so um, we basically tested out uh, the instrument. And I'm happy to say that uh, it has exactly the same sensitivity as the, core, uh, the uh, QPCR machines that they run in their complex labs. At, uh, at, at, at yeah. about $10 a test. Yes, and it takes 15 minutes from the raw sample, which is a nasal swab, to get your answer. So that's, um, that's, that's what I've been up to. That's why I'm 
uh, sitting here in my pond house. <laughs> but one of the questions, Axel, is what are the what are the next set of things that you would like to go after after glucose? I think I've read that right. Yeah, yeah. So so the the interesting biomarkers that are inter exciting for me uh, would be lactate. Uh, sarcosine or xanthine, uh, which would be a cardiovascular marker. Uh, we also, a lot of pets suffer from, um, from, from kidney failure. So creatinine or uh, uricase, uh, those are the markers that, that commercially would be interesting for the pet market. Um, and then you can you know, as we go forward, we will we'll learn, we'll learn as we go what kind of um, systems we can actually identify uh, problems for, right? Uh, so this is a learning experience. I think the, the key uh, opportunity here is, and it's also a problem, is that we haven't had the opportunity to measure anything, any chemistry, for a long period of time uh, in, in any animal uh, going through a disease progression. Uh, I think the, the opportunity here is that if we can measure on a long, uh, long time, then we can have a baseline measurement and we can identify the baseline and look at deviations from it. Uh, all these measurements would be really difficult to get clinical approval for uh, through FDA or IRBs, but it's actually relatively easy to convince uh, uh, an animal hospital to help us out. And in fact, we are working with uh, people now from with the, with the VCA group uh, that will hopefully help us uh, get this thing, this, these devices into, into pets in particular. And, uh, and I think that's very exciting because uh, yeah, there's lots of chemistries, lots of interesting biomarkers, but we honestly, it's sort of like being a kid in the candy store. There are so many things to try. We really don't know yet what is going to work. But I think uh, I, I'm of the opinion, anything reasonable that is measured continuously and changes is going to give us an idea of uh, what's happening to the health. There are certain types of cancers where early detection has a, an enormous ability to reduce morbidity. I think in terms initially of something like um, a pancreatic cancer. Now, uh, I don't think it's realistic necessarily to uh, implant uh, devices in 330 million Americans, but certainly uh, one needs to think about, is there some approach that can be taken uh, to providing screening where, for example, there is a genetic history uh, yep. and uh, how might that work with the technology that you're developing? Yes, so I think um, that's actually an interesting part of what um, we're trying to do, not with this technology, but with the PCR technology. It turns out that the biomarkers, there are lots of RNA biomarkers, microRNA biomarkers that work for some cancers. I, now, I don't know exactly, you know, how that it translates to pancreatic cancer and other things. But I know, for example, that for glioblastomas, which are brain cancers, there are specific biomarker sets that are microRNAs. And, if, and these are in the bloodstream. You can actually see uh, if it's upregulated that uh, there, there's a correspondence between having this cancer and then if you're in remission, that, that biomarker goes back down. So uh, the, the point is, if I build an instrument that can measure that RNA, and actually a PCR machine can do that, uh, then you can do these tests. The problem is that if I now have to go to a phlebotomist in order to get my sample uh, to, to be sent to some central lab, and then do that every day, uh, it, it's, it becomes logistically impossible to, to test myself, especially if I'm not able, you know, if I'm not at a high risk, if I'm not actually uh, treating the cancer. So the interesting opportunity is as we build these instruments, if they become available to the point where they are becoming consumer items that you can buy and put in your own uh, bathroom, for example, then it becomes possible for everybody to test themselves um, 
every morning. And, and the reason why this is important to do consistently every morning is we all have different levels of metabolites, okay? So if I measure uh, my microRNA level of, let's say, the, the mere 10 b or whatever the, 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 uh, the IO marker is that I'm looking at, it's going to be different than what Rich has in, in his bloodstream. And it will actually also change every time I do anything. Uh, so being able to measure um, consistently allows me to understand what my personal baseline is. And it's when, that, when I establish that baseline, I can then look for deviations from that. And that's the whole premise in both of these technologies, in, in both PCR technology and this implantable or injectable device that, that we're measuring uh, uh, you know, uh, materials with. Uh, the idea is if once you have a baseline, then you can identify deviations of that. And then you can understand how fast the body and your organs bring the chemistry back to that baseline after you see a deviation. And that's, I think, the indicator of health. So we'll probably, in my opinion, we'll have to go from away from measuring absolute concentrations and go into measuring changes in concentrations and rates of changes of the concentrations because that really identifies what our organs are doing. And that, I, I think that's an important point for both for both topics this evening, which is um, if you asked a physician, we have a few on the call, uh, uh, Teddy uh, Wei is a, or Fong Wei is a uh, nephrologist. If you said to him, I'd like to be able to measure, uh, you know, uh, creatinine consistently in, in patients who are, you know, approaching end-stage renal disease and measure it all the time, you know, my guess, Fong, is you would say, yeah, that'd be great, but it's not practical, and how would you do that? If I said you could do it for pennies a day and you can measure it consistently all the time, my guess is you would say, what else can I, what else can I add to that to measure for those yeah. patients? So we have a situation with a lot of physicians who are going to come back, and there's going to be an iterative process. And the same is true with what Julie and Kathy are doing. For some, Wait a minute, you can measure 10 particles? I can take, I can take uh, you know, 5 mLs of blood and 50 million uh, excuse me, 50 billion red blood cells, and I can pull out 10, I can isolate 10 particles of something, some pathogen, you know, well, what else can I do with that? And uh, th th those are the kinds of things that, you know, should be the next set of steps that we would expect out of both of these, these, these programs. Yeah, yeah Axel, um, I was fascinated by this. I mean, just, I know you don't really want to go through the hassles of the FDA and humans, but as an intensive care doctor, knowing lactate uh, minute to minute would be really useful with people with sepsis or heart failure or shock. Um, and uh, most of those patients have lines. A lot of those patients, uh, you talk about kidneys, having one of these devices in a dialysis machine could tell you whether you need to dialyze for two hours or four hours. And that makes a huge difference to the dialysis patient. You could put it in ECMO system, and you know you could you could wean the system off of the patient off of cardiac bypass. Um, so don't sell yourself short. Uh, there there are uh, great human uses for this kind of thing. Yeah, that, uh, you know our goal is to ultimately get clinical devices <laughs> into use, um, in you know by for for uh, patients. Uh, that is our ultimate goal. I think what's interesting is there are different ways to get from here to there. Uh, one way is to do a lot of tests on laboratory animals like rats or mice or, or even, you know, all the other animals that you can find. Um, and the other way is to work together with vets and say, instead of just having these animals and having to sacrifice them after the work, uh, why not just help out cats and dogs while we're doing this? And if it's a, a, you know, a sensor, it turns out, so long as I don't administer drugs uh, or new medications, the FDA is actually quite open to having measurements done so long as it's not cruel to the animal. You can, you can uh, do these measurements so long as a vet is involved. And so the idea is to we have these hypotheses, like for example, I'm, 
I'm hypothesizing that the change in concentration is more important than the absolute concentration, right? That's a hypothesis. I don't have any proof for that yet, but I can test this out in our furry friends. And if it works there, then we'll identify, we'll see that they are going to be healthier than we are. So our cats and dogs, when they become healthier than we are, we will adopt the same technology and it will become very easy to, to make that transition into the clinical world. Well, I can tell you, Axel, my dog is already treated. My dogs are already treated better in my household. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yes, we in have, some cases, that's already the case. <laughs> we, have time, we have time for uh, one last question from Fong, uh, if that's okay. And I'm sorry I'm, I'm cutting us off, but I, uh, we, the Zoom's going to end. And, uh, and, and frankly, I'm glad to keep you guys wanting a little more. Uh, so let's let's go to Fong, and then uh, we'll just go ahead and we're going to let you ask the last question and answer, and we're going to thank everyone and end. Well, um, inflammation is one of the uh, fundamental bases for a lot of uh, different uh, pathologic conditions, and I'm just wondering if you have been looking at any sensors for or biomarkers for inflammation. Yes. Yes, so uh, yeah, it is a very interesting question because what happens typically when you put a uh, sensor, uh, deploy it right now. So if you get a Medtronic sensor for glucose, for example, or, or a Dex, Dexcom or, you know, whatever sensor, you basically put it into the, uh, into the body through the skin. You end up having a lot of inflammation at the end of the needle where you're measuring. And it's almost impossible to parse away that inflammation, uh, that response from the sensor. Uh, because by the time the wound has healed, your sensor's lifetime has expired, typically. That's, that's what we have been struggling with over the last 20 or 30 years of building continuous monitors for clinical use. I think this is an opportunity. Now that our, our sensors work for longer than six months, we can actually put in the sensors. We may even not measure anything for the first week or two until the wound healing occurs. And then you start opening up the, the sensor chemically or, or physically and measure, okay? At that point, this inflammation response should have subsided. And then at that point, you can actually measure the inflammatory response the, of the body. At the moment, if I simply stabbed somebody and put through, with, through their blood, I am measuring inflama uh, inflammatory response because I've just stabbed somebody, right? And so to be able to do this without disturbing the tissue surrounding the sensor, to be able to measure things, I think is extremely powerful and very useful because as you said, you know, if I have a, a cardiac problem or, or a, many other problems, the inflammatory response is actually the first biomarker that I would want to look for. And, uh, and I think we can finally do this, uh, but, but what has been getting us there, what has been necessary to do this uh, is to increase the lifetime of the sensors beyond the wound healing time that is uh, typically a biological system. I just want to make a couple of closing comments about RI squared in the program and echo some things that were already said, which is um, I can't emphasize enough what uh, this means to the faculty at Caltech and how differentiated it is relative to programs that I've seen at Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and other places. It's not to take anything away from what they're doing at those other places, but it, it is different at Caltech in the following sense. The pace with which we've done it, the, and, and anyone who knew Jim Rothenberg, nothing I'm about to say will surprise you. Uh, the lack of bureaucracy with which uh, Caltech has done it, and the number of incredible companies that have come out of it in such a short period of time is kind of mind-blowing, given that we don't have the ecosystem around us that places like Harvard and MIT and Stanford and Berkeley have. Uh, and I think that's owed to two things. Uh, it's owed to our faculty, first and foremost. And uh, if Jim and Larry were here, I know that they would want uh, the credit to go to them. But it's also owed to an institution that has lowered every possible barrier to trying to solve these problems and make it easy for the faculty to go after these things uh, and to do it with the support of Fred and his office, uh, which, again, uh, most of you know, uh, 
one of our esteemed peer institutions in Northern California tried to steal Fred away from us. We were able to keep him. And one of the reasons they tried to do that is because he makes this possible with the faculty to be able to have this internal venture fund uh, that the Rothenberg Institute uh, embodies. So again, I wanna thank everyone for joining and particularly thank our faculty uh, and President Rosenbaum uh, and everyone who was involved in uh, putting this together. And then lastly, and most importantly, the Rothenberg family and Dan and Katie uh, for taking the time to come today. Thanks to everyone and uh, please be on the lookout for uh, the next one of these. Thank you very much. <laughs>